so uh, am I live if you can see me just type great so that I get to know am that I live? yes if you can see me just type great so that okay so things are pretty right yes great so I'm just checking if everything is okay you can if you are able to see me and hear me so meanwhile people are joining so we can wait for a moment and see if everything is perfect Good. So, I myself am a resident in ENT and head neck surgery. My name is Dr. Shivam and I have been in this neat PG sector for quite long helping you all in, uh, in achieving your things, in achieving your dreams. I started it with a hobby and now it is like I cannot remain without teaching you all so i hope whatever efforts whatever time you are giving for your preparation it 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 remains fruitful and you will be able to achieve the things okay so today's topic is very interesting and very important today we are going to discuss the clinical case scenarios so the present time examiners of yours are more focused on clinical scenarios. So things have reversed now from before. Before people used to go through MCQ books, read their theory and read the notes and sit in examination. Now things are moving in a different manner. You have to first visit your wards, your OPD and then visit your books. So today's session of these two, the otosclerosis and vestibular schwannoma will be in a similar manner. So we are visiting things in a retrograde way. Means first we will understand the clinical symptoms and then we will go towards the diagnosis. So as, as told to you that I am going to tell you a story. Because every disease has a story in its, itself. So if we start with our first story about otosclerosis. Hmm? So otosclerosis is something means we as an ENT surgeon we like some 4, 5, 6 diseases too much. And that is why those diseases are important for you to know. So among one, among one of them is otosclerosis. Some are others like angiofibroma facial nerve diseases and this uh, uh, angiofibroma already done otosclerosis vestibular schwannoma we are going to talk chronic otitis media so these topics should be on tip of your tongue so assume that you are sitting in your opd huh, and a 25 year old fair pregnant lady visits your opd now by fair i don't mean to be racial Every word here has an important. So a 24 year old fair pregnant lady visits your OPD with a history of slowly progressing bilateral hearing loss. So she has a slowly progressive history of bilateral hearing loss and what else? So if you see here, if I use my pen, okay, so So bilateral progressive hearing loss along with it she has a history of recent or a history of viral infection like measles. Upon more investigating you found that she had a family history of hearing loss that means in her family maybe her mother or uh, father has a history of hearing loss. So 
family history of hearing loss okay what else she said that her hearing loss deteriorated during pregnancy so hearing loss was there but things deteriorated while she is in her pregnancy upon investigation first of all you thought ki patient is having hearing loss let us examine the tympanic membrane of the patient and you saw that both the tympanic membrane bilaterally they were intact so a uh, intact tympanic membrane and upon tuning fork test you found that there was a bilateral conductive hearing loss now things should strike in your mind what things the rini's test was negative the weber was lateralized to worst tier that means there was a conductive hearing loss by tuning fork test what i mean is the patient was suffering from a conductive hearing loss and once you hear conductive hearing loss that means that there is some defect in the conduction mechanism maybe tympanic membrane perforation ossicular necrosis or something but here both the tympanic membranes are intact so now you should have suspicion of thing called otosclerosis so now you are having a suspicion of otosclerosis so any pregnant lady fair in color means white the white people have more predisposition towards this disease conductive hearing loss and with intact tympanic membrane now step by step we will see what else we find in this disease first of all you have to recognize that what disease it is so whenever your examiner ask you gives you these type of hint just remember that what has come to you is otosclerosis now so if we see the otosclerosis is a hereditary localized disease of bony labyrinth which is characterized by alternative phase of bony resorption and formation so this complicated definition i want to simplify it basically hota kya hai hereditary that means it has a inheritance pattern autosomal dominant so it is inherited as a autosomal dominant and in 50% of cases this has a autosomal dominant character localized disease that means it is localized to the bony labyrinth in the oval window and the cochlea with the bony part it is localized and there are alternating phase of bony resorption and formation so ultimately what is happening is the enchondral layer so otic capsule has three layers among which the layer which is involved is enchondral layer so this enchondral layer is getting replaced by the spongy bone so this is the pathology very simple in very simple words that you have to remember and what things now you can correlate with the history was patient was having a family history of hearing loss that means a autosomal dominant inheritance 50% cases are hereditary patient was a female a pregnant white a fair lady so female females are twice more predisposed to otosclerosis why every point here is important because these nb people ask mcqs based upon each of them so once they had asked you which are more predisposed so caucasians and the whites are more dis predisposed to this otosclerosis she had a history of viral infection or a history of measles so why measles because in some of the histopathology means post post mortem after the patient has died in the post mortem histopathology temporal bones we had seen this measles virus infection so there was a predisposing or a triggering factor of measles associated why more common or accelerated or worsened in pregnancy menopause and puberty can you tell me so if i ask you why more common in pregnancy so i have to watch the live comments so as to yeah aggravating factor is pregnancy right why so 
why it is more common so there is some hormonal there is some hormonal etiology so that is why it is more common in pregnancy and patient was a 25 year aged lady so usually it is between 20 to 45 year maximum between 20 to 30 year so all these points are very very important to fetch the diagnosis of otosclerosis so once you know your diagnosis then you can come to other points then you can say that oh this is otosclerosis and dr shivam has taught me so i will be able to solve this so this level of confidence should be there once you reach to a diagnosis you should be able to say that yes i know this topic and now i will be able to answer it so nothing is too complicated or too difficult once you have given the hard work once you have given whatever this competition demands right yeah so for comments i have to see it in my mobile yeah third decade so this is okay for you now coming to the most common type and the most common site so most common type is the stapedial otosclerosis and if it is asked the most common site it is fistula antefenestrum so anterior to the oval window what is happening here is there is conductive hearing loss why due to fixation of ossicles and basically the stapes foot plate over the oval window so in most common type of otosclerosis we have three different types of otosclerosis if you see one is stapedial one is cochlear and another is histological so this stapedial is the most common type and thus the most common site is fistula antefenestrum what you mean by it is just anterior to the oval window so if we see this picture here this is malleus this is incus this is malleo incudal joint here you have incus with the stapes head lenticular process of incus attached with the stapes head anterior crura and posterior crura of stapes and this is the foot plate having otosclerotic bone otosclerotic means irregularly laid spongy bone replacing the hard and chondral bone or the lamellar bone of the otic capsule so this is the most common type that is stapedial otosclerosis where the most common site is just anterior to oval window that is fistula antefenestrum so here two three mcqs have been solved regarding otosclerosis now what other complaints your patient had that fair pregnant lady had a slowly progressing bilateral conductive hearing loss so mostly this otosclerosis is bilateral in 70 to 80 percent of cases so here if you see in 70 to 80 percent of cases your otosclerosis is bilateral so something which is involving both the hear ears and having a conductive hearing loss without tympanic membrane perforation otosclerosis should strike your mind okay aggravated by pregnancy suggest a otosclerosis and one more history she told to us that she is able to hear when she is in party or when she is in a uh, night club or somewhere doing uh, with the uh, so many people in noisy environment while she is not able to hear in silence that properly so this means that she is denoting you a symptom of paracusis vilsi so what is this patient particularly complains you that he or she hears better in noisy environment so what happens in noisy environment is whoever is talking to you raises his intensity loudness of voice and thus more of the sound strikes with more intensity and some of the vibrations occur even in the fixed foot plate so this phenomena of paracusis vilsi is seen in 
otosclerosis or any condition of bilateral conductive hearing loss okay now what else can be seen in otosclerosis except bilateral conductive hearing loss so does it or whether it is vertigo or whether it is tinnitus so in ENT with relation to otology we have some common complaints like otalgia ear pain hearing loss ear discharge tinnitus vertigo so if we see ear discharge cannot be it is not in the scene what else can be there vertigo no vertigo is not seen in otosclerosis but tinnitus can be seen in otosclerosis which denotes a cochlear otosclerosis now we were saying that it had three types one was stepedial that we discussed another is cochlear and third is histological now you can ask me anything in the comment section if you find difficulty i am seeing it will be answering you so cochlear is once it involves the round window membrane so once it involves the round window you will get a sensory neural hearing loss so sensory neural component will come once this otosclerosis is involving the round window or it is a cochlear type of otosclerosis and that is why we said that tinnitus is mainly a indication of sensory neural hearing loss indicating a cochlear otosclerosis so what is this histological type so even the name is saying to you that this histological type, uh, type is the one that is diagnosed post mortem that means after the patient dies so you cannot make a diagnosis of histological otosclerosis when the patient is living so this histological type is diagnosed once the patient dies and you do a histology section histopathological section of the temporal bone of that patient so it is a post-mortem diagnosis while you have to remember that most common is stepedial otosclerosis now one more thing I need to tell you that that pregnant lady was very polite so doctor's day is coming so she was polite not out of respect to you or to doctors but she was polite because she was hearing her own voices by bone conduction and that is why due to this pathology she was very polite speaking in quiet and low volume so you were impressed by her means patients usually are very violent no? so but this patient is very quiet very polite why because this patient is hearing her own voices due to bone conduction conductive hearing loss air conduction is not possible so whatever is going is by the bone conduction that is why she was polite so they can give you in the questions like uh, polite or low volume speaking patient came to you okay now moving to the otoscopic examination one thing you saw that the tympanic membrane was intact another thing with regard to NBE is yeah why tinnitus occur because of the cochlear involvement because of the sensory component involvement so it might denote you a sensory neural hearing loss component coming so many a time mixed hearing loss is seen due to this also so uh, yeah so this is the answer so flamingo pink sign so for NBE you have to remember that while you are doing the otoscopic examination of that patient you have to see whether there is a flamingo ping sign present or not so this flamingo ping sign also known as short sign is a means it is a increased vascularity which you will see in the tympanic membrane somewhere so it is basically a congested area seen in tympanic membrane that we say it as plink blush of flamingo now can you tell me why there is plink pink blush of flamingo which is a indicator of active stage of otosclerosis now when I say active this means that 
the osteoclastic activity and osteoblastic activity that means resorption of bone is occurring at a very high rate vascularity is increased more formation of vascular tissue inside the bone yeah so in active cases why this sign is present so this sign is present because there is increased vascularity increased vascular tissue formation and that is why we see increased redness in that area increased congestion so it denote a active disease of the active stage of the otosclerosis so very important this flamingo pink sign and coming to the audiometric test renees will be negative so any time you will see that renees is negative because of conductive hearing loss so bone conduction will be greater than ear conduction weber will be lateralized to the worst ear that means with the greater conductive loss and absolute bone conduction test will be normal so what is that what is this absolute bone conduction test so they can ask you uh, separately with regard to absolute bone conduction test this test is in the name itself it says that it test the bone conduction that means what we do here is we compare the bone hearing bone uh, means hearing through the bone conduction of the patient with the examiner assume that i am doing the examination so i will assume that my bone conduction is normal and once i assume that mine is normal i will compare my bone hearing bone conduction with the patient conduction so what i will do i will take a tuning fork i'll vibrate it over a hard surface keep it over the mastoid process of the means mastoid part of the patient in the behind the pinna and close the tragus so closing the tragus means we are just blocking the air conduction and only testing the bone conduction whatever part is conducted through the temporal bone mastoid part of the temporal bone into the cochlea so if the patient says that he has stopped or she has stopped hearing we will keep this tuning fork on our side and see whether we are able to hear or not so if we are able to hear and the patient has said that he, he or she is not able to hear that means the patient's bone conduction is less or shortened but if it is v means if even i can also uh, not able to hear the this tuning fork that means the bone conduction of patient is similar to bone conduction of the examiner and that means the absolute bone conduction is normal now in this case as there was a conductive hearing loss the air conduction was defective but the bone conduction is okay now a specific test that is asked with regard to otosclerosis is gillies test and don't mistake it it remains negative or there is no change in bone conduction threshold so gillies test most of you might be knowing but you have to remember that there is no change or negative so what is negative gillies test what we do is we increase the intra means external auditory canal pressure with a pneumatic speculum and by increasing what we see is that with the increased pressure there is decrease in the bone conduction thresholds why because with increase in pressure in or in the external auditory canal tympanic membrane got pressed and it caused the fixity of means it caused the stapes foot plate against the oval window and finally the pressure is now transmitted to the inner ear this inner ear is causing fixity of the basilar membrane so basilar membrane is not able to vibrate because of this increased pressure now because of that that patient or normal patients will be able to hear less that means the hearing will reduce with the application of increased pressure and then in normal patients gillies test is positive means there is decreased in hearing but as in otosclerosis the foot plate is fixed over the oval window there won't be transmission of the pressure that we have created in the external auditory canal to the inner ear and thus there will be no change in the sound 
so gilles test will be negative or no change in the bone conduction thresholds in case of otosclerosis so do remember gilles test in otosclerosis don't make it wrong don't make it wrong so this voice should be there in your mind if gilles test and otosclerosis is being asked there is no change gilles test is negative okay so because ossicular chain is fixed now very important thing is tympanometry after you did your pure tone otometry we did a tympanometry and due to stapes fixation the middle ear compliance was reduced and we found a as type of curve now by as type of curve what i mean is this so as type of curve actually is not given here but okay so if this is a actually a tympanogram but if it is a it is a pure tone audiogram but if i draw a tympano tympanogram normal curve is a type as type of curve is where there is reduced middle ear compliance so this as type of curve will be seen because ossicles are fixed if it would be a ossicular disruption you would see a which type of curve you would see a so write me which type of curve you would see a so i i want you to write in the comments which type of yeah so which type of curve you would see in ossicular dislocation in in b type of curve we see in perforation c type of curve you see in when you have a otitis media with a fusion or something like that yes yeah as type of curve so tympanometry is showing you a as type of curve and what about the stapedial reflex so acoustic reflex will be absent why because stapedial reflex is caused by the contraction of stapedius muscle and fixity or the movement of the stapes now as the stapes is fixed you will not be able to elicit a stapedial reflex with the movement of stapes in the tympanogram in the impedance tympanometry we were getting a spike but this spike will be absent as now the stapes is fixed and in the tympanogram the characteristic finding that you would see not in all cases but for your examination purpose they will give you this a notch or dip at 2000 hertz in bone conduction curve and that is called carhart notch so i would like you to see this carhart notch pardon me for this changing the slide but if you see this pure tone audiometry this is the this dotted ones are the bone conduction curve continuous line is the air conduction curve so here at 2000 hertz frequency you are seeing a dip and this dip is called carhart notch why this notch notch occurs because everything in our ear has a resonating frequency so our stapes has a maximum resonating frequency at 2000 hertz and that is why whenever the sound reaches 2000 hertz as stapes is fixed we get a notch or dip or decrease in hearing at carhart notch now things to remember is this carhart notch is present in the bone conduction curve okay now if i ask you if this notch is there at 4000 hertz can you answer me i'll wait for a few seconds for your answer can you tell me what is this notch called and why it occurs yes if you can tell me why it occurs and what is this notch called so if i'm talking about a totally different uh scenario at present but it is important as i am discussing it right now it will be called a boiler's notch seen in noise induced noise induced or noise trauma noise induced hearing loss understand another very characteristic finding of otosclerosis tympanogram is you would you would get a airborne gap ab gap airborne conduction gap so this 
AB gap should be there for the diagnosis of otosclerosis and this AB gap should be minimum or greater than 15 decibel. So if you see in this graph, this is around 15 and if, if, if you see at 500 hertz and this is around 45. So sort of 30 decibel AB gap you, you are getting. So this is the way usually you have to take average of 500, 1000 and 2000 and then the whatever average comes or whatever summation divided by 3 will be the final average or the final AB gap present. So it should be greater than 15 de decibel. Okay, so Karhat notch is another pure tone audiometry finding that you see in otosclerosis. Yes, here also you can see a dip at 2000 Hertz called Karhat notch. So if we summarize the classical audiometric finding, it's very easy. You will get a low frequency conductive hearing notch, Karhat notch type A or AS so in initial stages you can get A but as the disease progresses, the stapes foot plate gets fixed you will get a AS type of tympanogram there will be a absent acoustic reflex and negative Rini's test so yeah boil is not noise induced you are right histological otosclerosis the gold standard is histopathology but you can't do it in living patients so histological otosclerosis the, the gold standard is histological examination of bilateral temporal bone so as always in medicine we rarely do the gold standard things but these NB people don't leave you so you have to know also the gold standard in case of histological otosclerosis and one thing you should always remember is the confirmatory diagnosis for otosclerosis, confirmatory or definitive diagnosis for confirmatory or definitive diagnosis, you have to do tympanotomy or means you have to elevate the tympanometal flap, examine the movement or the fixation of the ossicles intraoperatively so confirmatory diagnosis is only possible once you are operating on patient you try to move the malleus with the movement of malleus incus moves but stapes didn't move that means stapes is fixed and then your diagnosis of stapedial otosclerosis gets converted to clinical otosclerosis because now it is confirmed so before in the stepidotomy, that is the treatment for this treatment of choice for otosclerosis, we always and always confirm before proceeding to do the stepidotomy that whether the stepis foot plate is fixed or not. And if we ask you what is the imaging modality of choice, so high resolution CT scan is the imaging modality of choice. Here you would see a hypodense lesions and so wherever this otosclerotic foci will be present, you would see a hypodense lesion and a double ring sign can be seen here also, a double ring sign. Now, with regard to the treatment, we have a variety of treatment and first of all, you should know that operation in this case is little risky. So that is why you need to consider several things before operating before choosing the patient for operation the so preferred for means first of all you will try to see whether observation can be carried it or not so for unilateral disease because 80 80 percent were uh, around bilateral but rest 80 to 85 so rest 10 to 15 percent were unilateral in those cases you can see whether the hearing aid can function or not if the patient is too old if there is only mild conductive hearing loss present. So if you see with the stapes foot plate fixation, you get a maximum means you can get a maximum with fixation of stapes foot plate. You can get a maximum conductive hearing loss of 60 decibel. 
so stapes foot plate is fixed and tympanic membrane is intact so can you tell me ki what would be if tympanic membrane is perforated for now just tell me whether it it will be and there is ossicular necrosis so whether this hearing loss will be more or less if tympanic membrane is perforated and there is ossicular necrosis or disruption and if it is intact conductive hearing loss so what we will say is there will be more hearing loss when tympanic membrane is intact and stapes foot plate is fixed so not in all cases you will observe a 60 decibel but maximum hearing loss is seen when the stapes foot plate is fixed and tympanic membrane is intact so in cases of mild conductive losses you can just observe with the hearing aid and if the patient is not concerned too much with the hearing then no intervention is needed we usually what we do is we see whether the disease is progressing or not and we do the audiogram on yearly basis and then we see whether the patient requires any intervention if the things worsen medical therapy is usually followed with the active otosclerosis so in active otosclerosis when we get swart sign when things are vascularity is increased we usually don't try to operate on that don't that patient so we try medical therapy with sodium fluoride bisphosphonates and hearing aid so this fluoride therapy has two three important questions with regard to your examination one is dose so dose is around 50 to 70 mg per day for one to two years means long therapy with fluoride what it does is the mcq so it reduces the osteoclastic activity and increases the osteoblastic resorption so just remember this fluoride therapy is doing good to you so pardon me so this fluoride therapy what it is doing is it is doing good by doing good means it is increasing the osteoblastic activity and reducing the osteoclastic activity so don't replace both of them okay so by this it inhibits the maturity of means the active foci it reduces and what other thing it does is it inhibits the proteolytic enzymes that are cytotoxic to the cochlea so these proteolytic enzymes were causing sensory neural hearing loss and it is inhibiting now any medicine you give you must know what are the indications and contraindications so one indication we already talked was the active foci so radiologically active foci and <laughs> new onset active disease you give medicine other cases like when it is advancing so when in cochlear otosclerosis when it is rapidly progressing cochlear otosclerosis or malignant otosclerosis why we are saying it malignant because it is now involving the cochlear component of hearing it is involving the round window and causing sensory neural hearing loss so to prevent it to progress and cause sensory neural hearing loss we give the medicines so adverse effect if asked is most common is gastrointestinal disturbances and the contraindication when you will not give is in case of our patient that is the pregnant women lactating women lactating women children you will not give in cases of chronic nephritis and chronic rheumatoid arthritis you will take care so these are some little points only hearing will give you the required memory during examination to answer now just to recall things all are true statement regarding the sodium fluoride use in treatment of otosclerosis except so see they had already asked let me see whether you can answer so except the thing you have to say is except that means they are asking you which is false one so first is it inhibits osteoblastic activity you can comment a b c or something b is used in active phase of otosclerosis when short sign is positive has a proteolytic activity contraindicated in chronic nephritis so it is answer is yeah 
so it inhibits the only difference is between osteoblastic and plastic and that is why we had highlighted it blastic and plastic it increases the osteoblastic decreases the osteoclastic yes so this all you know I'm not going into it medication which may prevent rapid progression of co uh, cochlear otosclerosis again you know the answer is fluorides now moving to the surgical treatment so surgical treatment the treatment of choice nowadays is stepidotomy previously we used to do stepidectomy so stepidectomy was the removal of whole of the fixed stepes so removal of stepes along with the foot plate but in stepidotomy what we are doing is we are removing the so if this is a, your stepes over the oval window what we are doing is we are removing this part that is the stepe superstructure with the head neck anterior posterior crura but we are leaving the foot plate we are leaving the stepe's foot plate the fixed foot foot plate and what we are doing is we are doing a perforation in the fixed stepe's foot plate and giving a prosthesis so what we will do is we will first disarticulate the incudostepedial joint remove the suprastructure and then will give a prosthesis in this stepes foot plate so things will become more clear when you will see a operative video of the so let me play one of them so as to give you a better just to give you a better understanding of it so yeah so it is playing yes playing so here you see the first step is local anesthesia so usually we prefer local anesthesia and we give it in all the four quadrants of the internal logistic canal why local because intraoperatively only you can see what improvement ha has occurred so this is our stepes where foot plate is fixed so we are seeing a laser stepidotomy now first step is to elevate the tympanometal flap we gave a end oral incision so here you can see 6 to 8 millimeter behind the tympanic annulus in the internal auditory canal we are giving a incision and then we will elevate the tympanometal flap so here the surgeon is elevating the tympanometal flap in the posterior superior region so this is the first step after we give the local anesthesia and the end oral incision between 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock 12 o'clock means this is 12 o'clock this is 6 o'clock 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock so in the posterior superior region now while elevating we have to take care of this fine nerve so why I am showing you this is because they can give you a video intraoperative video everything is now audio visual so you should be familiar with the intraoperative video so here you can see the corda tympani nerve so this delicate nerve you should not injure otherwise patient will have dysjusia anterior two-third of the tongue he will not be able to feel the taste sensation what surgeon is doing is he's trying to do the exposure that is required for doing or per perforating the stepes foot plate so up till the base of pyramidal process so that you can see the pyramidal process base you are curating this posterior superior bony wall of the external auditory canal and now what all you can see you can see your long process of incus you can see the corda tympani nerve you can see the incudostepedial joint here this is the anterior and posterior crura this whitish structure is the facial nerve so many a times 
we have to see whether this oval window is visible to us or free or not for perforating. Many a time we see that this facial nerve is bulging or we can say overhanging. So if oval window is covered with facial nerve, it is very difficult to perforate the foot plate for the piston insertion. So you will see here. So then what we do is with the help of laser or with the help of perforators or with the help of skitter drill we try to make a perforation in the foot plate and before that you have to dislodge the incudo-stepetial joint so this is the lenticular process of incus this is the stepes head and what we are doing is we are just disarticulating why because one is we have to remove the supra structure and another is any movement might cause movement of whole assembly so that is why we dislocated it manually and remove the stepes head the anterior posterior crura leaving the foot plate so there was a question that which all the structures are removed in stepidotomy so in that question there was one of the option like lenticular process of incus so we are not removing any part of incus we are only removing the stepes the stepes supra structure which includes the stepes head, neck, anterior and posterior crura. So now the surgeon has removed the stepes supra structure made a perforation with the help of laser. So here <coughs> CO2 laser can be used, the other argon laser can be used. So with the help of laser we are making a perforation and the position of this perforation is very important. We make this perforation at the junction of middle one third and the posterior one third so we divide the foot plate into three regions the anterior middle and posterior and at the junction of middle one third and posterior one third we make a perforation and then we place the prosthesis it can be any teflon piston or anything and then one is one will go to the stepes foot plate another will go to the incus long process and then we Reposit the tympanometer flap, ask the patient whether he is able to hear better or not. So we can check the hearing improvement intraoperatively only. And after we place the piston, we, what we can do is we can seal the area of the perforation with fat or anything so that you don't, uh, we don't occur any <coughs> gusher from the, uh, gusher of the fluid from the inner ear. So this was the procedure it was important for me to show you because you should know what you are studying and what practically surgeon do in a stepidotomy. So now the surgeon is placing some, uh, usually we place gel foam here also they are placing a gouache piece and all and then the uh, patient is. Now it's, it's a basically done as a daycare procedure has less complications but still some surgeons prefer to keep patient and observe okay now so this was the one of the we have I have several of them will post in the telegram group of the unacademy and in the unacademy uh, app also I have described in a bit detail of everything so stepidotomy you have seen and in which patients you will do this stepidotomy so in patients <clears throat> so in patients where the airborne gap is at least 25 to 30 decibels so you know by now ki how you calculate the airborne gap hearing three short should be 30 decibel or more Rini's test negative a speech discrimination score should be greater than 60 that means patient should be able to understand things even if he has a uh, greater AB gap because if the speech discrimination score is very bad improvement will not be there and this stepidotectomy we do not do nowadays because it was associated with more complications more complications like while you were removing the stepes foot plate there was chance of injuring the inner ear so that is why it was associated with more complications and nowadays we don't do stepidectomy except in very rare cases or revision cases the treatment of choice is stepidotomy okay so video we are over with let us solve some few questions 
so that's to refresh yourself and the refresh the knowledge yeah so following operations are done in case of otosclerosis so can you answer me this it's a pgi type question just type a b c d e whatever you think yeah <clears throat> let me see whether you can answer it or not stepidectomy it is not asking the ideal it is asking what all can be done so stepidectomy we already talked about stepidotomy we already talked about but fenestration was also introduced by one surgeon where the concept was same that is making a perforation in the foot plate so fenestration operation was also done and one thing more you need to understand while doing stepidotomy sometimes or many times we have to cut the stepidious muscle also so the steps will be like elevation of first will be local anesthesia then it will be elevation of tympanometal flap then it will be <coughs> checking elevation of the tympanometal flap checking of the ossicular integrity then ossicular integrity means you will try to move the malleus the incus and the stepes see whether confirm the diagnosis confirm that stepes foot plate is fixed then what you will do is you will dislocate the incudo stepedial joint with the instrument that curve pick then if the oval window is adequate what you will do is you will try to perforate the stepes foot plate with the perforator i will show you a perforator how it looks like you will measure the length of piston so you will how you will measure you will measure it with the help of a measuring gig jig uh, this measuring rod so this instrument they can give you it's a uh, called a measuring rod so it is a measuring rod what function it does is it has markings like 1 2 3 4 so this part will be at the foot plate and whatever length the incus long process will be there we will take it so there are marking of it 4.24 4.25 4.5 mm 4 mm 4.25 mm so the important is the length we measure is from the foot plate to the under surface of the incus long process of incus so if you see this this is a figure of measuring so this rod this is the measuring rod it is going into the perforation and this marking is measuring from the under surface of incus and later what we do is whatever length comes we add 0.25 mm in it why we add so that the incus whatever is left the width of the incus is added so usually we take the length of the piston so this is the piston piston uh, it is not shown but we have a piston like teflon piston is most commonly used it is like this so this length of this piston is the one we we try to measure okay and this will be at the long process of incus this part will be in the foot plate of the oval window so this is the just the intraoperative picture that you were seeing so they can give you just <coughs> identify different structures very important so this is this is long process of incus this is corda tympani nerve so we had just elevated it so as to get a picture of the foot plate foot plate of stepes this whitish structure is very famous for ent surgeon this is facial nerve running like this okay so here will be oval window above to it is the facial nerve this is the incus long process of incus here is the stepes anterior crura and the posterior crura so once you see intraoperatively it will be more clear but just have an idea of things this was the measuring rod and after you measure you have to insert that teflon piston in this measuring jig so this is the measuring jig just remember that these instrument are in stepidotomy instruments so this is measuring jig where we insert the stepes teflon piston and measure whatever length we have got so just for a general idea i wanted to show you these 
so here the answer is PGI type question, stepidectomy, stepidotomy, fenestration. All are done, but investigation or treatment of choice is stepidotomy. Now this question, in otosclerosis during stepi surgery prosthesis used is most commonly we use Teflon piston. Which of the following is not resected in stepidotomy? So see, this was the question we were talking about. So as the time is little less, I'm not giving you that much time to answer, but want to give you maximum whatever I can in this part. So stepedial ligament or stepedial tendon is also cut in the process. Anterior and posterior cruras are cut with the help of laser or skitter drill. So there we can use a skitter drill also. We can use laser and just we can use some <coughs> micro instruments to cut. So anterior posterior cruras are cut so that we can remove the stepi suppressed structure. We have to cut this stepedial tendon which is getting attached to the neck of stepes but lenticular process is kept intact. So it is not resected. Answer is D here. Okay. So newer modality is stepidotomy and this is what I wanted to see. Wanted to make you see this is the stepes piston that I was talking about. Okay. So this is over the long process of incus and it is in the foot plate okay here you can see this facial now and stepi suppress structure is already removed now contraindication of this surgery is when the patient has only hearing he ear so now if your patient says or if the patient has only one functioning ear, you would not do stepidotomy in other ear, in that ear. So always remember if that otosclerotic ear is the only hearing ear of the patient, that means from the other ear patient is deaf. So you are not going to do a stepidotomy surgery. You are going to prescribe him hearing aid on medicinal therapy, whatever you do, but you will not do stepidotomy operation or operate for otosclerosis if that ear is only hearing the ear of that patient. So mark my words, remember this. This is the absolute contraindication that only, only hearing ear is not to be operated. Other occupations like athlete, divers, who are frequent air travelers, why? Can anybody tell me why it is contraindicated in them? Because due to increased pressure, one of the complications of surgery is the dislocation of the stepes piston. So in, this, in these people, their occupation is such that due to jerk, due to increased pressure, this <coughs> the prosthesis may dislocate. And this uh, gusher from uh, means inner ear fluids can come out. So for those patients, we usually do not do this surgery. Other relative are the Contraindication are the in pregnant young children in any active infection like otitis externa and media because by doing a perforation in the foot plate you are making an entry for inner ear. So if there is any infection these bacteria will enter into the inner ear and they will cause then cochlear toxicity or sensory neural hearing loss due to damaging of the hair cells in the cochlea. Tympanic membrane perforation. So first you will repair the tympanic membrane. If they give you a scenario where there is otosclerosis and tympanic membrane perforation, the first surgery you will do is tympanoplasty. Wait for six months, let the graft uptake happen and then you would operate for stepidotomy or operate for otosclerosis. Exostosis, medically unfit, active or malignant otosclerosis. Most Com important complication is hearing loss. So sensory neural hearing loss can occur. So that is why you would not operate both the ears simultaneously but in a gap of six to one year after the first surgery and as a rule always and always the worst ear is operated first because you do not want to render the better ear worst after the surgery. Then the patient will hold you with collar and say hey what you did. Huh? You operated me and now I am not able to hear. So at least operate on the worst ear. So if they give you a clinical scenario, just remember that. Or if any patient visits you, 
tell them that we will operate you on your worst year and because then if he gets an improvement he will appreciate you because now the patient is hearing in his worst year so i don't know how much time i am left with but still continuing with this uh, a 31 year old female complains with bilateral impairment of hearing for 5 year on examination tympanic membrane was normal so in these type of big big questions always try to highlight the important pick the words and just fetch the diagnosis go to the answer so just see what all you can do you can take the age from here a female patient <coughs> bilateral impairment of hearing then tympanic membrane is normal a good finding hearing loss with tympanic membrane intact something is striked now what you will see a bilateral conductive so conductive hearing loss tympanic membrane is fixed what it can be either a ossicular disintegration or ossicular necrosis or a fixation of ossicles now in case of <coughs> ossicular dislocation you would be seeing a ad type of curve but in case of fixation you would see a as type of curve now the things are pretty confirmed in your mind so this is the way that fast you have to fetch the diagnosis fast because the most important thing in your exam is your time okay so answer here will be all constitute the treatment and at last you should see and always and always read the last line of the question so take my point always and always read the last line of the question because even if you have known everything this except word will make everything mess so all constitute a part of treatment except hearing aid yes stapedectomy yes sodium fluoride yes gentamicin no so anyway stapedectomy constitute a treatment we don't prefer it but gentamicin is totally no otosponges is inherited at if we answer yes you were right it is autosomal dominant yes and one important thing is one syndrome associated with it is if the patient presents to you with a history of multiple bone fractures since childhood and you observed blue sclera and you observed that patient is having bilateral hearing loss of conductive type things are going towards otosclerosis then you should surely know that the examiner wants you to know that whether you know this wanderhof syndrome or not so osteogenesis imperfecta with blue sclera and otosclerosis so any syndrome is important for you because nb people are syndromic people so they want you to know all the syndromes like neurofibromatosis wanderhof syndrome and what not so you should always give little more focus over these so most common site of otosclerosis is oval window most common site for initiation is fistula antefenestrum most common type is stapedial most common site is fistula antefenestrum in front of oval window just a summary most common site for stapedial is fistula antefenestrum and most common site for cochlear otosclerosis so here a word cochlear otosclerosis changes things for you now the most common site is not fistula antefenestrum but round window and that is why you get a sensory neural hearing loss right common age for otosclerosis is so it was 20 to 45 year among it this is the most common means most appropriate one 50% have a positive family history females are more common in india always mark females are more common <coughs> although in histopathologically if you see males and females are equally responsible but as such females are more common whites are more affected 20 30 year pregnancy menopause trauma major operations these are the factors which increase it viral infection like measles have been shown to be associated with it otosclerosis or otosponges have a bilateral conductive deafness and i think vestibular schwannoma we will continue with our next session because i in no continue 
in our next session do let me know in the comment section how you liked it and in the telegram group you can message me i have even a youtube channel of my own with the name of neat pg by dr shivam so you can also comment there and approach me for any help that is needed i am always there and i want you to do better so whatever difficulties you are facing you can reach me out so for today i will end the session hoping that <coughs> everything goes good for you till then stay happy stay healthy and do whatever you love to do so do comment like and let me know how things worked out for you so this is dr shivam signing off good night So give me a thumbs up.